Hello and welcome to jasonnewland.com My name is Jason Newland This is Let Me Bore You To Sleep And please only listen to this when you can safely close your eyes Um so I'm sitting here at my desk. It's actually it's a table, and this table used to be in my grandmother's flat, and I inherited it from her. So, it's a very, very special table to me. It's a table that I'm going to hold on to for the rest of my life. Unless, of course, you know, there's a a garden party outside and there's a bonfire and we run out of wood. Then I might chuck it on there, but just to keep the bonfire going. But other than that... I'm going to keep this table for a long time. Unless I get a better table. Because there's not enough room in this flat for really more than one table. Because ideally I'd have like a big office desk. Because... This is where I do my work. My, I know some people, including family members, do not class this as work. But to me, this is the most important thing that I could be doing with my life. Unless I was like a doctor or a nurse or a fireman or Therapist, or I kind of am a therapist, or, or a milkman, or a postman, or driving a train, or putting plastic penguins into boxes. You know, this there are other more important things that maybe I could be doing with my time. But outside of that kind of stuff, I think this is a pretty good thing for me to be wasting my time on. Yeah. I've got to mention something, and it's, it's not really relevant, but it is to me. And I might have mentioned this yesterday, but I have no idea what I said yesterday. I'm fortunate that I don't... I don't hold on to that stuff. Conversations, I do. So if I have a conversation with somebody, I'll forget about it. You know, it'll be kind of got gone but it will be stored so if that person for example tells me that their first car was a mini and then four years later they tell me that their first car was a Ford Cortina suddenly the old memory pops up and it's like a spot the difference puzzle that you get in magazines and newspapers so contradictions for some reason stimulate my brain to remember what has previously been said 
sometimes I mention it, sometimes I don't, sometimes there's no point, and sometimes when I do kind of point out the discrepancies in their story, I get told, oh I didn't say that, well you know last time I didn't say that. I remember one thing my dad said to me, and it wasn't just to me, it was to me, my brothers and sister at the dinner table, probably in the 90s, and he said, whatever you do, don't have kids. That was his advice, uh, to have a happy life, don't have children. Which is probably not the best thing to say to your children, but, and I always remember it for that particular reason, because it was so kind of outrageous, really. He may have said it in humour, but I don't know. And then I pointed out to him, probably about six, seven years ago, that he'd said that, and like, no, I never said that. So there you go. Yep, this is therapy for me. <laughs> right, the thing I was going to say is on Sunday I cleaned the carpet. You know, I kind of, uh, I didn't scrub it, but I, you know, washed it with a mop but you know with uh, soap and you know and I did two parts of the floor the bit, a bit in the living room and a bit near the front door and for the last two days the flat stinks absolutely stinks of like mould or kind of mouldiness which is coming from the carpet I can't I half feel like I just want to rip the carpet up and chuck it out the window but then I'd have to cut it up into little bits because it wouldn't fit through the window but you know I've, either, I've run out of it uh, yesterday I sprayed deodorant onto the carpet in the hope that that would sort it out. And it usually works on me. Didn't. And I had some, uh, like, what's it called? Oil. I'm trying to look to see where it is. I don't know where I put it. And it was uh, kind of like the oil that you put into oil burners and it's Yang Yang which is one of my favourite ones I like tea tree um, but I used to use tea tree on spots and things like that like blemishes because it's an antiseptic a natural antiseptic and I did, I did study aromatherapy for a while, back in 2003. I'll tell you another one I really like. And I didn't really understand this. Because uh, it's from, you know, the Bible story. Um, even if it's a different, you've got a different, uh, you like... Uh, you read a different book, you like different stories. This this is probably one you've probably heard um, of. You might not have done, but I'll, I'll tell you it anyway. But I'm not trying to convert you or anything from uh, whatever it is that's, you know, getting in the way of, of stuff. Um, I, there's this story where 
Jesus' parents. He was just uh, still in the womb. So he was still in the womb and his parents were looking for a womb to, st to stay in in order to give birth because they were fleeing Galileo or whatever. Um, anyway, the, it's a long story. I won't go into it because um, I can't be bothered. I mean, it's, that's even too boring for me to start telling you biblical stories. I mean, they're, they're lovely stories, but I don't... This doesn't seem the right place to really do that. But the point I'm trying to make is, where, where would I stop? You know, do I go through all of the world's stories? Uh, I have thought about that. I have thought that, you know what? I've read the New Testament probably more than once. I've read parts of the Old Testament. Out of life, I said I'd read the whole thing. But I have read, you know, I was given an Old Testament Bible when I was about 10 and it was like proper old you know it's falling apart I mean the only time I've ever seen uh, read material that was that um, you know that messed up and used was some of my magazine collections but, well, I say mine, they were my brothers to start with. I kept them in a cupboard in my bedroom with all my other religious stuff. So, I had this, this Bible and I read a bit of it. I got a little bit kind of Bob begat Susie, Susie begat, bleh, 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 bleh. it just went on a little bit too long, you know, the, the beginning, I think it needed a bit of editing, you know, um, and I had a, the same kind of issue with Buddhist scriptures as well, because I've read a lot of Buddhist scriptures over the years, a lot, lots and lots and lots. And it's like the Pali Canon, and it's, it's this big, huge collection of works that is, is, is broken up into different sections, but there's a lot of it is it's the Dharma, which is the teachings of the Buddha. But also there's teachings of teachers, um, like uh, quite a few, and then uh, Padmasambhava, the various different teachers, some of which were disciples of the Buddha, some of which were disciples of the disciples. So it goes on and on. But sometimes the the story that's being told it repeats so uh, for example I don't have it at hand I've got my my Buddhist book of uh, Buddhist teachings it's only it's not a big book it's got a few hundred pages but it's quite small that's like nothing compared to the thousands and thousands of Pali Canon pages so and then baskets they've got like different individual baskets they're called which breaks them up into categories this you know what for people that don't know about Buddhism it might actually sound like I know what I'm talking about and yeah, I do. I'm very, very clever. But for those of you that do know about Buddhism, you're probably thinking, what's he on about? He ain't got a clue. And you're right. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just making it up. 
so there's a lot of repetition a lot of repetition which I think in those days it's been explained to me it's because it was an oral it was it was they were being taught orally so there was a lot of repetition a lot of verbal repetition in order to memorise the teachings but when I got the New Testament I was at school and I was in I'd say I was in the first year of high school so I was about 11 and the Gideons came in well I don't know if it was a bunch of people just one person but they talked about the Gideon Bible and I can't remember what he talked about to be honest I was too busy trying to get chewing gum out of my hair but at the end of it they handed out Gideon Bibles and they had read Gideon Bible I've actually got one uh, it's not the same one but I've got one like a one that I got recently like the last few years and I love this little book I don't know why I just loved it I like free things that's nice it's just nice to get free stuff especially when you don't know you're going to get it you know I think the best meal in a restaurant I could ever have would be at the end the waitress says no charge it's on the house it's free And you know, it wouldn't have even bothered if they'd given me dog meat on a plate, covered in custard, cold custard. If it's free, it's like, oh wow. I was going to complain and report you to the health standard of your horror to you or whatever. But wow, now I love you because it's free. So I do like free stuff. And I was intrigued about this Bible. I suppose because it was so little. And I was little. I was probably, I don't know, out of the whole school, I was probably equal to maybe two other people as being the littlest in the school out of however hundreds of people there was hundreds of children the headmaster was only three foot tall but that was okay because I could still look up to him I know something about having a head teacher being able to tap them on the head I think it gives more of a, a sense of trust and respect. I can always respect someone more if I can just pat them on the head, give them a lump of sugar. I don't know why that is. So I had this little Bible, this little red Gideon's New Testament Bible. And perhaps I should point, well I don't have to point it out, but I will. When I was little, I mean in age, a lot younger, um, I was living in a children's home run by Catholic nuns. And so I, and I went to a Catholic school. So basically, 
Catholicism was my entire life for those years that I was there. And I had a church in my garden. Can you believe it? A church in the garden. And there's also, I think there was a, uh, like a, a passageway through the house into the church. I'm just going just gonna to close my tablet because I'm not using it. I was going to maybe use it, but I haven't. So I'll just... I'm not going to use it then. But, yeah, so I lived in this place. It's called Nazareth House. As in Nazareth of Galilee. No? Is it Nazareth of Galilee? Nazareth, that's where Jesus was born, I think. And or was it Blackpool? It might have been Texas. It definitely wasn't Canada. Yeah, I forget. But that was the name. It was the place was called Nazareth House, and there was lots of them worldwide. You know, not just uh, in England, but in Scotland, in Ireland, in Wales in Ireland, I think I said that, and England, and in Australia, I think there was some in Canada, there may have been some in America, I'm not sure, and so it was, you know, it's a big operation. And I lived in two children's homes. So one in, was in Newcastle, and that was a Nazareth house in Newcastle. And then I moved to South End, which is so Newcastle is up like the northeast of the country, and South uh, South End is in the southeast of the country. And South End had a beach. Well, it still does. And uh, yeah, the, <laughs> the sea hasn't gone anywhere, it's still there. I actually dated someone from South End when I was 35. And it's really weird because, well, you know. A female liked me, so that was that was strange. But then it was kind of unusual going back to South End, as I hadn't lived there since nineteen seventy seven, which is quite a long time. Especially if you're waiting for a bus. So. I actually did. I did go there in 1991. And 1996. Um, the first time I went in 1991. I was living in London. And I thought. You know what. I'm going to go and visit Nazareth House in South End. And I think it was a Saturday. So I just went up there, got the got the train and the train to South End is pretty easy, pretty simple journey doesn't wasn't that long about 40 minutes on a train I do believe maybe longer but not long long although I did go to South End another time with a Spanish 
lady that I was semi-dating and uh, that was in 1994 so I went on to yeah I went on to the pier with three different ladies one in 1994, that was a Spanish lady called Marta. And then there was, what's her name, in 1996. And then there was the other one in 2006. So in 1991, I just went on my own I'm not sure if I had a girlfriend at that time but I did eventually I had uh, I would say probably my first proper girlfriend in 1991 I had had girlfriends but this was kind of like my first real like uh, adult relationship where I went out on dates and I don't know fell in love or whatever that stuff and I met her because I was working in a kitchen it was in a bakery a big huge bakery and I I was working there from, I don't know what time, probably seven or eight o'clock in the morning until, well, just like standard eight hours a day. And it was Monday to Friday. I'm pretty sure though, I'm pretty sure but sometimes I'd go in on a Saturday as well for the lunchtime or the breakfast lunchtime. But that might have been overtime or on a rota. I forget. I should correct myself. I don't care. I don't care what, what, what it is. I don't I really don't remember, to be fair. But I do remember walking into work because Saturdays was an early start and so there was no buses so I had to walk all the way from Stratford all the way to um, where was it? Walthamstow long walk long 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 it was pretty good about an hour to walk there but there was no buses there was nothing like during the day, in a week, I'd get a bus in. But for some reason, or was it a Sunday? Maybe there was no buses because it was a Sunday. Or maybe there was buses only so far, but no further. I just recall a meeting with one of my co-workers who also worked there and we walked up past Lee Bridge Road I think it is and crossed it and then walked up to Wardenstow where the massive bakery was I'm not sure if it's still there but it was there a long time ago I mean, you know, we're coming up to 30 years nearly, aren't we? What is it now? 1999? No. 2019? 2019? So, 2021 will be... That's over 14 years. So, I remember, yeah, so... Yeah, we walked up there. 
and it wasn't a bad job really you know it was hard work but you know jobs are supposed to be so I didn't have any problems with that and it's basically just getting all the food prepared cooking it serving the breakfast to that you know on a daily basis get in on a Monday prepare the place prepare not the place we didn't unless it was a, a fish day and we would serve fish but I don't recall ever serving place but I used to serve place when I worked at a chip shop and that's a real the thing is with place is there's a skill there's a knack to putting it into the fryer and having it come out flat and it takes it took me a while to learn to learn it because you're basically if I remember correctly unlike all the other fish where you just plonk it in with place you've got to kind of put it in then pull it around and kind of let it float the other side and do that until it's flat and your fingers are like really close to the oil but obviously not in the oil otherwise that would uh, that'd be fish fingers wouldn't it oh dear and then you let it go just at the exact right time and it's flat but if it's not done at the right time it curls curls up and it makes no difference to the taste you know it's still the same but people like it to be flat I guess so I did um, we had this system where we just I don't know how many people were working with me there was one there was a chef and he was more just telling us all what to do and you know, I, I got on really well with him and he taught me to do stuff that he, which was his job. So, um, for example, the stuff that we, I would normally do, would just be putting the sausages in the oven, um, getting the beans ready, just basic stuff to get them served into the hot tub containers, the metal containers, and then to put them out ready for serving and that was for the breakfast and then we would make the eggs fry the eggs as as they were asked you know kind of had them on the go at the same time and we wasted loads but that's just the way it was but and I got a little bit bored with just doing the same thing every day and I said to him why don't you just kind of help you to do some of that stuff so he said well you can help with the vegetable preparation and you know because he used to cook meals like big uh, lasagnas uh, curries and all that stuff and I said why, why don't you just teach me how to do it or teach me how he wanted me to do it and then I just do it so he had less to do it wasn't for that it's just, it's just so that I, I had something to do because it was a bit more interesting so plus I'd done catering before I went to catering college for a year when I was 16 but I hadn't really been that hands on to make food for hundreds of people uh, in because it was a big canteen a lot of people to be served they had probably about four or five hundred people working there maybe more because it was a 24 hour operation 
so I did eat it. My boss, the chef, taught me how to make lasagnas. But they were big lasagnas, you know, they weren't just like little lasagnas, they were massive. And I had to make a few of them. Some of them were vegetarian, um, some of them were, you know, different, like halal even, I think they had different kind of, because this was in, I said, in East London, so there was a lot of uh, different food requirements for the staff. So it was, uh, it was interesting in some ways it wasn't challenging uh, apart from the serving time now bearing in mind I'd spent two years serving fish and chips in a chip shop that was very busy you know I'd also worked in a pub that was very busy I was not really too bothered about serving people. I'd also worked in a uh, in a supermarket, which was very busy. So I'm kind of used to having that queue of people, frustrated at how slow I am. You know, that's just <laughs> just the way it is. But these people, some of them, were so rude to me. And I didn't really understand it until I, because I ended up working in the actual bakery itself, because I got made redundant from the the catering part. So that got took over by a an agency. And I remember working really like sixteen hour shifts, and then waiting to to get food. And just seeing my lunch break going, dripping away really quickly because of how slowly the person was working behind the counter. So I kind of get a, got a little bit of a taste of my own medicine, I think, on that one. But uh, yeah, it used to be funny, really, because they were always waiting there when it was breakfast time as soon one second after the time that it was supposed to be ready to serve they'd be banging on the on the metal thing so it was like a shutter they'd be banging on it like shouting out stuff at me and it was quite funny because some of the people that were rude actually ended up being my friends they they realised that and it's something that I've known for a long time it's such an obvious thing don't upset the person that's feeding you even if you're paying for it don't, don't upset them because it's not that I do anything dodgy but I'll definitely take my time with them I'd go even slower I'll put the beans on individually the baked beans, like, so how many, you want one, how many baked beans would you like? How many sausages? What? One, two, eventually, they kind of came round to my way of thinking, and I got on with, well with everybody, especially with the managers of the bakery, for some reason, and I don't know why, because I was very cheeky, very rude, and, well not rude, but just outspoken maybe a bit, yeah, rude probably, but cheeky, I would say. And they seemed to like it, because the managers was two brothers. There was the overall manager of the, the place, and his brother was like second in charge and yeah they just I even remember the names which is funny it's a bit weird um, and their sister worked in 
the accounts department, I think. And me and her got on really well. And we spent quite a few break times together, like having lunch and just chatting. And I don't know why, we just got on really well. And what was really strange, this is totally true, she, there was something I, I kind of, I had a, some, yeah, I, I, I couldn't work for a few weeks. Well, I kind of went AWOL for, not a few weeks, probably about a week. And then I came back and I didn't have a job because you can't just take off like that, which I, I accepted. It's like, okay, fair enough. But I had to go in there and collect my wages for the, you know, the back pay and my P45. And on the way in, or on the way out, I don't remember, I saw that lady there, the, the boss's sister. And she stopped and started chatting to me. And that's really, not strange, but she said to me, she said, you know, if I wasn't seeing somebody, I would, I so would be with you. She told me that she really liked me, really fancied me, and you know, if she wasn't seeing somebody, then she'd. It's like wow. So it's quite strange. It's like bittersweet. It's on one level, I was collecting my, you know, my last pay salary, or pay, you know, weekly pay, and I didn't have a job. But on the other side. Thankfully, she was seeing somebody, so I didn't have to date her. <laughs> no, in fact, you know, it's like it was like kind of a compliment, really, that she just said that. Um, I was like, oh, oh, okay, thank you. I'm blushing. See, what I should have said is, well, if you really like me, can you please butter up your brothers and get me my job back? But. I didn't kind of think that far ahead, I don't think, at the time. Um, but yeah, my girlfriend, who I'd split up with just before that that time, that was kind of part of the reason I was off work. Anyway, I met her, and she was an agency worker. Because we constantly had people taking time off work. So, you know, every every three or four days would have an agency worker in and they were limited to what they could do because they didn't know the job. So they'd just like be doing the washing up and uh, cleaning and, you know, and if they'd been a few times then maybe they could like serve and do some of the other stuff. But to be fair, anybody that's not been there before, they're still quicker than me serving I kind of like to think you know, I never got one tip you know apparently according to my boss getting a wage is enough but it was quite low money it was quite there was no minimum wage back then there is now it's about eight pounds something an hour, not a week. That'd be weird. Um, but it's eight pounds twenty an hour, something like that. But back in nineteen ninety one, there was no minimum wage, so I I had jobs that were sometimes one pound ninety an hour. And this job I had at the bakery was it was more than that but I still probably wasn't taking home much more than a hundred pound a week maybe a hundred and twenty 
but I, I wasn't that bothered about the money. You know, I had a job, I could pay my rent, and then I could go out at night, maybe not every night, but quite regularly, I could go out at night and do comedy gigs. So I had enough money to get me around traveling. And back then, traveling was a lot cheaper. And you may say, of course it was, it's nearly 30 years ago. But it's not just that, it's just, it was a lot cheaper. Compared to now, it's not, it's quite expensive to, to have a day pass to travel on the tube around London. You know, it used to be really, really, really manageable. Now, I'd, I'd, I think I'd struggle a bit if I was there all the time. Paying like £12 or whatever it is just for a day, a day travel card. Just seems a lot of money. And... So it was quite a good job in that sense that I had my evenings free and my weekends free mainly apart from when I did the odd shift but then what happened okay, I'll come to that in a minute I met this, this girl called uh, Cherry Cherry Ann her name was and she was from Trinidad she had, I mean, she literally had just moved to London probably for a few months, maybe even like six weeks or something. And she it's quite weird because I just felt an attraction to her. I felt a like a closeness, like I'm not even sure what it was. It was a mixture of different things, and we seemed to get on okay. And also, I know I talk about me being slow, like yeah, I talk slowly, I walk slowly. Back then, I had a little bit more oomph in me and I was a bit more wired a bit more very kind of up and down very you know uh, but quite fast at times really fast and then other times really I suppose quite excitable at times. But what I found with her is I felt relaxed with her. And I didn't really feel relaxed at all at that time. You know, ever. So it was just to feel relaxed with her I felt nice. It was like, oh, she's got superpowers. She can relax me. Well, I asked her out for a date and she said yes so I I don't think I even took her telephone number or gave her mine and there was no mobile phones at that time it was just landline which was it's amazing that anybody got together and procreated without mobiles just landlines the amount of faffing around involved anyway I arranged to meet her at Liverpool Street Station I think it was probably Saturday evening maybe seven o'clock just as an example so I went there and she didn't turn up I 
and some bloke was standing there as well and he's like, I got chatting to him and he, he said yeah he said I don't think she's turning up I said no at least I'm sure she, she is she's running late you know maybe getting the bus and start instead you know it's maybe there's a train issue or I don't know it could be a mixture of things and she said well, she, she said to me well she could at least text you to let you know that she was going to be running late and I said mobile phones haven't been invented yet he said oh I forgot sorry he said I said it's okay don't worry and uh, we held hands had a little bit of a cuddle and uh, you know waited for my date who never showed up so I just was a little bit well how anybody would be I suppose in that situation I didn't skip home you know I wasn't like singing at the top of my voice a nice you know Beatles melody and I thought well that's that never mind and then going to work Monday Tuesday and then Wednesday who do I see standing at the sink there's my boss he was washing his hands and I said alright boss he said yeah I said you look, you look upset what's wrong he said oh Tina hasn't turned up again he said she fell over in the shower how can you keep falling over in the shower I said I don't know I've, I fell over in the shower and, and broke my wrist when was that well, that's 2014. He said, it's 1991. How can you have fallen over the shower in the future? I said, I keep forgetting. We were talking about the past. Okay, I'm back. 1991, I'm here. He said, yeah. I said, oh, okay. So we've got to get in there. Got another agency worker coming. And uh, in she came and it was... Cherry Ann, my dumpy or dumper, and the fur you could see that she was embarrassed. I mean, she knew she was coming there. She didn't have to come. She could have sort of said, "No, or can you send me somewhere else?" But and she just apologised to me, said, oh, "Sorry about that. I wasn't able to get there," and. Uh, Unfortunately, my the battery on my mobile had run out on my mobile phone. I said, there is no mobile phones. And she said, oh, I keep forgetting. We need to get this straight. It's like 1991. She said, okay. She was older than me. She was about 23 or 24. And I was 20. She might have been 22. She was older anyway. Not by much. And uh, she said, and it was her idea, so I said, oh, don't worry, I was just going to leave it there, you know. Yeah, don't worry, but we've got to work together for the next seven hours, so we might as well just get on and do the job. And she said, well, we can, we can go out this weekend if you like. And I said... I think I said yes very quickly yes please yes please so we did we started dating and went to different because she was from Trinidad I thought I'd show her around London and do the sights because when I was a child I got to see the sights of London and like Madame Two Swords, Tower of London, Wax Museum, uh, Trafalgar Square, the Palace, um, I don't know, some lamppost. 
you know, just the, the things, the places. And so I thought, a town of London, yeah. So I thought, I'll, I'll show her and the sights, which I did. So I took her around places, took her to comedy clubs, went to take her, but I went with her. But I led the way because I knew where they were. And yeah, it didn't, I mean, it wasn't like a massive, long relationship, but it was, it was the longest one I ever had up to that time. Because, you know, I mean, I've had relationships that lasted less than 30 minutes. So, you know, it's, uh, So I, she was so slow when she did things. I remember we went to the cinema and she went to the toilet. So I'm waiting outside the toilet. And I think, you know, the end credits were coming onto the movie screen when we got inside the movie. She took that long. It's like, what was she doing in there? Honestly, I'm like, was she knitting a cardigan for an elephant? I mean, she must have been doing something, some massive task to have taken so long. So it's, you know, but she was very relaxing. And she was a trainee nurse. She was a student nurse. And she, that's why she came to London to become a nurse. And then she moved to another part of the country when her nursing studies began. So I visited her, but it was a bit more, less often. So I started dating her probably February, March, February time. And then it was the summer, end of the summer, when it finished. Probably maybe August. Possibly September. But I've dated a few nurses, which is a bit strange. I don't know why. Not, I don't know why it's strange, but I don't know why I've... Because I've had... Uh, had, I've... I didn't finish the sentence. I've had relationships-ish with, um, who was the first nurse? That was her. Yeah, she was the first one. But then I dated a nurse in 1996. Then I kind of had a Nursey, nurse, I had a, an interaction or like a kind of dating for a short time in 97. Then in 90, about 2001 or 2000, I dated a nurse. No, 1998, I dated a nurse. She was a student nurse as well. So were the other th two, of the, so three out of four were student nurses. And then in 2001, I dated a nurse. It was the end of 2000. And she was a qualified nurse, so she was working at some hospital in London. 
so that's five. And then in 2004, I dated a, right, for a short time I dated a nurse. It was actually a blind date. And uh, yeah, that was it. So that's six, six nurses. It's not even that I've got a thing for nurses, it just, just kind of happened, you know? I'm not sure how I got onto the subject of nurses, I'm just trying to think. There must be a reason I got onto the subject of nurses. Hmm. Probably the one that lasted the longest was the one I dated in 1996. And yeah, I'm not sure if I've dated any nurses since then. I dated a former nurse. So she was still qualified, but she just wasn't working as a nurse. And that was in 2005. So I don't know if that counts. But she she basically was bringing up children. So she, uh, she was raising young children, so she stopped nursing for a bit. But she was qualified as a nurse. What other ones? No, I think that's it. That's seven. If you include... Cause I suppose if you're a nurse and you're qualified and you're not working in that environment at the moment but you're going to go back to it and you can go back to it because you're qualified then you're still a nurse. Yeah. Oh well. I'm going to go now. Take care. Speak to you next time.